Thank you all for having me here. And I'd like to t talk to you today about my passion for the last five years, um, which I'll do with some slide reordering here. Uh, the first item there is actually what I've been focusing on, how to get more accurate and complete gene sets out of the burgeoning gene evidence sets that we now have. Um, it's my perception, I think many people's perception, that our informatics ability to reconstruct genes hasn't kept pace with the high quality and complexity of gene evidence over the past several years. So I've been focusing in on how to do that. I think the, line, the first three lines there, um, we know now that for human disease genes, we're not really recovering all of those genes accurately. Recent studies show that 20% or so of our disease genes are not, not accurately described in the genomes. Now that we're out engineering our, our agricultural and pest species to try and solve some of our problems, GMO um, organisms, including Mosquitoes, the, the Aedes that carries the Zika virus. Uh, we're, we're modifying these organisms' genes without accurately knowing what genes they already contain. That might be something that we should look at. And certainly in basic biology studies, no, accurate knowledge of the genes is a fundamental problem in fully understanding the evolution and orthology and many um, genome biology problems. So back to the start here. What is evidential gene? That's what I call this project I've been working on. Um, the name is clear enough. I work with gene evidence as best I can to try and turn it into to faithful, biologically faithful reconstructions of that gene evidence. And the, 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 the primary tool that I work on is a gene classifier, how to tell which gene models are good and which ones are not quite as good. And down at the bottom, there have been three variants of this evidential gene project. The first one is very similar to what many of you understand as genome gene prediction pipelines. And I'm not going to discuss that here, but I've worked on that. Now I'm working on gene assembly, which is taking primarily RNA-seq data and putting it together as accurately as possible, not using a genome reference, not using any complicated extra data, just trying to get the RNA put together the way a puzzle should be properly put together. I've, I've switched to that because I think it can be done, and uh, my results make me believe that it's producing a more accurate gene um, set product than current, many current genome assembly pipelines. And the, the third step, uh, combining both of these, is something I'm working on. But to get back to this evidential gene R, what is it in, in its basic components? The first step is to assemble your genes, but overassemble them. Make many, many more gene models than there actually are real genes. Using many different options, many assembler products, to try and get in your overassembly the accurate subset. The second important step is to use an evidence measurement, a coding sequence ruler, which gives you a biologically accurate measure of which genes are good and which models are not so good. The third step is the, the more accurate use of reference genes and homology alignments to actually verify which are the biologically accurate gene assemblies. And the final step in this, this evidential gene, our product, are clean it all up, 
publish it, make sure it gets into our public databases so other people can use it. So the coding sequence rule that I'm using now is, is a part that most others are not, and I think it's a, a critical part. I won't dwell on this, but many other transcriptome assembly products look at total transcript size, variations on that, N50, reads map, map. Those are technical measures. I believe the coding sequence measurement is a much more biologically useful one. There's a close correlation between the size of the coding sequence that you recover and the homology alignment to reference protein. And that's important. Um, so back to why everybody should be using evidential gene. Um, the first three words are the important parts. It's simple, relatively simple in its basics. Uh, assemble the RNA, measure it, and you're done. It's objective. It's not using a lot of assumptions. It's not using the reference genes to actually build new genes, as many genome modeling pipelines are doing. And it turns out it's also accurate. If you use a homology alignment to reference as your, your gold standard for accuracy, this, this is objective, and it gives you a good idea of what's the more accurate and what's the less accurate gene. OK, the, the next two. Uh, bullet points are my explanations of why I think I'm getting the observed higher accuracy rate. They're not a priority reasons. Um, why is this overassembly better than doing one assembly, say with Trinity? It's because each locus has different properties has different expression properties and different neighboring gene properties. These all affect how that locus should be best assembled. And the second point there should be clear enough is that each assembler product has its own weaknesses. If you use many assemblers, they, their weaknesses are different. You end up among and over assembly having the best correct the second point, main point there, is that assembling genes turns out to be better than predicting genes on a genome. Um, that, from looking at a lot of gene evidence on, on, on comparing what is good and what is bad, um, the reasons for that turn out to be reasonably clear, and they're based on the different sources of error found. And, um, transposons, chromosome problems. Predictors themselves are not doing as good a job as they could. And complications in loci, trans, transplicing other things, are really not handled well by genome gene predictors. Uh, so here is my summary example of where evidential gene is doing better than um, Maker, better than Trinity, better than NCBI's uh, very good eukaryotic annotation pipeline, and some of the others there. Um, a couple of plants there. Uh, Margaret, some of Margaret Stanton's collaborators have also been my collaborators with Pine, Loblolly Pine Tree and with uh, the Chocolate Tree. And Evidential Gene is turning up by this objective orthology measure, more accurate gene sets. With a fish, um, evidential gene and NCBI have been matched up for the same species, and my gene set is turning up a, a more accurate and complete orthology set there. Likewise, with some relative fish, with insects for the honeybee um, and for a few mosquitoes that I've done this uh, spring. Um, I specifically picked the mosquitoes because there have been recent publications from Vector Base using Maker 
and from others using Trinity. And so what I'm comparing there is pretty much just a basic simple gene assembly with evidential gene to their gene sets. And I'm getting some more complete gene sets there. This is, for gene assembly, a comparison of two of the mosquitoes, Aedes and Anopheles. And it's an explanation of why the different assemblers I use, Velvet, SOAP, um, IDBA, and Trinity, are turning up different amounts of accurate genes. Uh, on, the on the left there, uh, Velvet down to Trinity, those bars show the amount of accurate genes recovered. On this side is more of an explanation of why there's that difference. This deals with the shredding size for the genome assemb for, for the gene assembler. The uh, Kamer size with low Kamers you get only a subset of the most accurate genes. With very high Kamer shredding up to the read size, you get a small proportion of very accurately assembled genes. And when you take the whole set there of options, you can pull out the most accurate genes from all of those to get, using many parameters, a more accurate collection. So this is just. Uh, a more detailed explanation of the components of how evidential gene works. The first four parts are the main pipeline for classifying your overassembly of genes, finding the coding sequences, remove redundancy, perfect redundancy. And then the fourth step is the more critical, important part, use the BLAST alignment to identify loci by exon overlap and classify those loci as the best based on your coding ruler, the alternate good ones, and the redundant excess. And then the following steps, assess orthology, annotate, and publish are additional steps for giving you the basic complete publication gene set. All right, this is a cute example, a representative one from mosquitoes of 25 genes, highly conserved in all plants and animals, um, evidential gene versus vector bases, and the Trinity assembly. Uh, it's showing, of those 25, if you look at the zero baseline, about half of those are equivalently reconstructed in the different gene sets. Um, a, a couple of, of evidential gene loci are below zero. They, they were 10% or so not as good by orthology alignment. But the majority of, of another 12 were better by a little bit, and in some cases by an awful lot. Um, some of those very tall bars indicate that the other gene constructions completely missed these highly conserved orthologs using the same data. This, I think, oops, as an example of one of those anopheles on the top, Aedes on the bottom, the Aedes gene sets from vector base and Trinity just completely missed a very large ortholog. Um, on the top for Anopheles, in yellow is the vector base model, which is a fragment of the complete gene, uh, shown in green from my reconstruction. And uh, this is just some of the details that I won't dwell on of how the main algorithm works and the other components that are involved in that. The main algorithm other people are using without my help, um, and it's a fairly simple input-output product that I think you can stick into Galaxy without major work. I note that one of Margaret's, or yeah, 
Dr. Stanton's uh, collaborators, uh, Jill Wurziger, is actually using evidential gene on some uh, other tree genomes without my help. Um, and apparently she likes it. She's published a couple of papers with it. Um, so take her lead. Try it out yourself. Don't believe what I say. Test it, and it's the basic product is easy enough to install and test drive on your laptop. Um, as I say, others are using it, but it does need some more work to make it easy to use. Um, it would be great to have it installed in a, a biologist-friendly product like Galaxy. And eventually, if I have time and I have collaborators, we can get it working so that it's a fairly automated, simpler process for biologists to use. And of course, any of you working on genome projects, please give it a serious thought to try. It's not as hard as the current gene prediction pipelines to use, and I believe it actually works. So there you go. Um, I'll be happy to take your questions, and especially any, anyone interested in, in using this more, please contact. Oh, well, if you want to use four assemblers instead of, oh, performance in terms of memory. Well, if you've only used Trinity, the other assemblers I use are not a whole lot different. They use the same data input. You have to do some shuffling. If you have a cluster with enough compute power, you can run them all at the same time, and they'll be, all be done at the same time. Velvet is known as a memory pig. However, there's a trick answer to that. It uses much less memory at the high Kamer level, which Trinity doesn't work on, and you get some of the best, most complex genes assembled at the high Kamer level with Trinity with Velvet. So I was, I was uh, impressed to see the comparison um, you did with the orthologs to say this uh, whether whether one method of, of annotation is better than another. But I wonder if that's, is that the ground truth, or is there something, is there a harder, is there a more firm um, set of knowledge about these are actually correct as opposed to comparing to a database which may be flawed? Oh, you mean um, which reference gene set do you really trust in terms of measuring the accuracy of your reconstructed genes? Yeah. That's kind of up to you. Uh, with Anopheles, with the mosquitoes, two mosquitoes, I just use the fly-based Drosophila as my reference. There isn't, for insects, a uh, better studied reference gene set than fruit flies. And so what I get with the, the mosquitoes I've reconstructed is many of the fruit fly genes are much better represented in the evidential gene reconstruction. And if you don't believe the fruit fly genes, that's fine. But you can pick whatever reference you believe in, and I think you'll find the same answer. Which ORF prediction software are you using? You just said the smart ORF. Is that the part of Bioscience Angel? Pardon? The ORF prediction. Oh, ORF prediction. I'm using my own modification of Brian Hass's original PASA, but he's repackaged that as transdecoder. The standard ORF calculation is standard. Anybody will get this, anybody's will get roughly the same answer, but mine is tuned to what I understand about gene assembly mistakes and other stuff. Transdecoder has an option to use blast evidence. Are you using that or just? No, no, no. I'm using as simple as possible an ORF calculator to make this efficient. And the, you can use your own ORF calculator if you want, but um, the, the, the final measurement, the fine measurement is done after the 
major problem of redundancy reduction. So the ORF calculator I use is an efficient first step. I see. Because I found that uh, if you use the blast evidence at the ORF prediction uh, step, it improves significantly the, the ORF prediction. So it's something we can talk about later. Sure. There, there are ways to, to modify what I've done if you wish to improve it. Thanks. Oh, you have another question? No, no, that was it. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, so.